guys. Oh. It's getting enough speed to crank it up, drop the clutch in first, and then get it running and break before you hit something in front of you or behind you. And he said, I had to decide how I wanted to win. I didn't like the other two, so I bumped her after you. He got second, so. It's, it's that ability to just sit with a pencil and then create a model and then, you know, create these lasts on which people tap this metal. I would love to be able to do that. Hello and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 53. If I look like I'm sitting in a car and I sound like I'm in a tin box, it's because I am. I apologise, but I didn't make it home in time. My fellow addicts should not have any more of their gracious time wasted by a dickhead in a yellow Porsche. So let's get on with it straight away. Um, what is the best startup procedure for a motor car? This this has got legs because there are so many great startup procedures. I'm going straight into Neil Clifford, who I suspect has owned most of them. Well, I don't, but I, I own a very good startup procedure car, which is um, the most gorgeous Bob Peterson Bentley, Ooh. made in officially one of the best counties of the UK in Devon. And... Um, it's I describe it as a as a it's not a, a replica or it's not a sort of anything bad like that. It's a singer Bentley. It's a Bentley blower with extra bits. Bloody fantastic. And if you if you want to cheer yourself up, go and buy one. They're brilliant. So how you do it? And there's there's a whole A4 piece of paper on how to start this car, and it never fails. But what you have to do is you um, pull out the ignition and there are two fuel pumps. You have to pull out both little fuel pumps. You then have to obviously give the throttle two or three big giant pumps, but you then turn off the ignition and you then got a little flip up like you're flying a lightning jet, a little flip up button, one of those ones with the covers. Oh, the safety little red safety the, cover thing. The safety one, because the fuel tank is obviously right in the back, which the back is like 24 metres behind you, but the engine obviously is in the front. So you turn off the ignition, and what you then do is you, you press the starter button, but, which is pumping the fuel up to the engine. but without, Presumably through a hose pipe. Uh, no, no, through, through a highly technical titanium, okay. I'm sure it's made of. Um, pipe takes the fuel all the way to the engine and then what you do is as you've done that for four or five seconds you then pull out the ignition again you must have pulled out the choke i've forgotten the choke the choke is just underneath the dashboard but the choke only stays on for about four seconds if you leave the choke on for a long time it all gets a bit puffy and all a bit sort of asthma like because you've got too much fuel or whatever's going on so you then Pull out the ignition and bang, 100% guaranteed start on the button. And it's the most gorgeous um, heart-rendering loveliness of starting procedures. And then off you go. You press the choke in within five seconds and, you know, 80 miles an hour in second. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Everyone every, every uh, should go and visit the Peterson... Uh, I don't know what the bloody website is. Peterson Bentley website. Just, yeah, bloody we amazing. should definitely go and do that. Christopher Cooper, tell us about your favourite startup procedure. Well, I got. I knew that Neil would have just the best mechanical, electrical, beautiful startup, and that was love. And we got to. We have to see that either down in Devon or somewhere in the middle. Uh, I got two. Yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. We can, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so, so uh, Neil, Neil Clifford, a uh, delightful story about his beautiful <laughs> pizza and Bentley. I'll now step on Chris Cooper's toes, who thought he was assuming the role of being the coordinator, but he's not. Um, so, Chris Cooper, you tell us about your start procedure now. As I was just saying before I was really interrupted. <laughs> you bloody Judas! 
<laughs> I've got two. I'm, 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 I'm away for a minute and you're in my seat. You're The bed was still warm. It wasn't me, Gov, it was him. <laughs> the bed was still warm. Boss, Boss Eduardo. Uh, I've got two. Um, it's amazing how simple but lovely the startup procedure is in a Porsche 962. It's just a key. It's just a yeah. key like a 964 or a 993 key. It's just a key. You put it in ignition, you turn it, you crank it, it fires and it starts. It's just, it almost doesn't get better for that for me. How that's the starting procedure we all know, and it still works in one of the greatest ever racing cars ever made. You could go and buy it. You, you could take your trailer down there, buy it, pay your money, pass check over. They give you two sets of keys, a little bit of a key fob, all those forms you had to fit in, that to fill those forms in those days, all the regulatory stuff. The other one, the one that's really, really weird, and I still don't quite understand it, is how weird it is to start up my Mini Magic. This is this Mini 1962 Mini that's been modified, resto modded by Swift Tune. Um, all, of, all of my motoring career, my common sense has been, it's easier to start a car if you put your foot on the clutch just to reduce the drag when the car's starting in the gearbox. Yeah. In the magic, it doesn't work. You leave your foot off the clutch. If you try and put your foot on the clutch to start it, it's like the battery's half flat. I've asked Mr. Swift, why is that? And he gave me a really complicated ex explanation I didn't understand. So the weirdest startup procedure is when you're trying to start a mini magic, you don't put your foot on the clutch. That mini race car, Monkey, you drove oh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. forthcoming episode of Landau Laps. Yes, yes. Uh, watch this space. Um, there's a rather comedic part in that where I try and explain to you why you shouldn't put your foot in the clutch, but I couldn't remember. No, oh, and I, I couldn't work it out either, but it does make sense. When you try it does to make a clutch, difference. It, it, so it I think 962 like or Mini Magic, don't put your foot in the clutch, which is against somebody hopefully will write in an engineering expert or colossus. Will write in and explain to us why that's what I don't understand it. It's useful in. consumer advice. Useful consumer advice from the addicts. See, if you've got a mini magic, one of the yeah. seven that exists, then we can help you uh, to start it. Manish, yeah. what's your favourite startup procedure ever? There was a little period of time about a year ago on this podcast when um, Mr. Clifford would send us some startup procedures on the WhatsApp group. And there's one which I just will never forget. <laughs> it literally said, because I woke up relatively early that day, like 6 a.m. But this startup procedure, I think it was like 5.19 a.m. The sun had just come up over Tring. And you could hear the words, fuck, bollocks. <laughs> and he was fumbling to find the key <laughs> to the car. But the next thing that happened was the phone was still on. We were just looking at um, actually Mr. Clifford's rather shapely calves because he was wearing a dressing gown and slippers, but not a lot else. Yeah. And these and things were just walking forever and ever and ever. And we were thinking, gosh, he lives in a pretty grand palazzo. And finally, through some doors, he sat down. I think it was either. Do you have a Bristol 410 or an 11? I did. I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was that car. it was brilliant so then the keys go into the door the door opens these these feet now we can see his knees find their place in the seat and you see him put the key in and the whole thing you you, you see it go halfway and then nothing happens and then it does it again and nothing happens and you see these feet sort of slightly moving you don't know if things are being pumped or braked or whatever and then it goes again and it goes Fuck. And then there's a pause and he goes, this is, this is the fun of, this is the whole point about doing this. Then there's another pause and he goes, this is like therapy for me. This is therapy for me. Ying, ying, it still doesn't start. Ying, ying, it still doesn't start. Ying, ying, ying. And then he uses the collecting cars C word, which is the C word with an IO at the end to describe this beautiful Bristol. Then he has one more go at this and you hear, <clears throat> And he goes, that was really, really satisfying. And he turns the engine off. 
and walks back yeah. to the kitchen. That is the world's greatest ever startup procedure. Neil, with your permission, can we post that video again? Yeah, yeah, I'll get it. Good. The yeah, best it, bit it, was, I'm not sure Manish's microphone worked then, so, so anyone listening and watching, it, it just went like this. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, it, but actually, but it, it, start, it, started with, it started with Neil talking about, he just built it up perfectly for a fall. It was like the commentator goes, this beautiful piece of English engineering, it never fails to start. <laughs> it's just, it's Except just, now. It's, it just goes... Rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> and it, and it, as, the, as the pantry slowly shits itself, it gets slower and slower. Yeah, that's just, I do, it, I that's do what, remember, yeah. I'll find the video. It's just old cars, isn't it? Old yeah, cars. It's old cars. Old cars.com. Uh, Edward Lovett. So I was, I always thought there was a particular way to start an early 9 11, and it would normally be ignition on, a couple of pumps of the throttle, and hopefully it'll fire up. And they generally feel, they sound in the first, in the first crank, it sounds like it's not going to fire up, and it eventually does. Until. I went up to Tuttle a couple of years ago and it was early in the morning and Richard's way of starting an early 9-11 is just bury the throttle, crank it and, and just keep keep it buried until it, it spits smoke and oil and everything out it's the back. metal. Yeah, exactly. So I, I've learned uh, Richard's way of starting a 9-11. I, I, I think a 60s Ferrari turning on the ignition, turning on the fuel pump and letting the um, the fuel pump churr away, just uh, tick, 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 and the ticking slows down until the fuel pump is full and then, and then cranking is a pretty wonderful way um, to start a car. But actually, the, my favourite startup procedure is a car where the battery doesn't work and the jumps Ooh. and the jump start. And ideally, the jump start with only one person to help you push the car or maybe no one to help you push the yeah. car. So you can't really get enough speed up to use second and you've got to use first or reverse. That's my favorite one. And then because the wall might be in front of you, it's getting enough speed to crank it up, drop the clutch in first and then get it running and break before you hit something in front of you or behind you. That's probably uh, my, that, the the art of jump starting is my favourite starting uh, procedure. Almost, I almost need to stop you there and say, um, on reflection, we need to have a totally separate conversation about best jump starting stories. I bet we've yeah. all got some. We got to do <laughs> that. When, uh, when one's father's pushing one's you know first car and they get their leg, their Farrah trousers caught in your mini's wheel, <laughs> yeah, and God knows yeah. all that shit. So, um, I, I think st the startup procedure might be the sexiest thing that a car can give us because it it's it's anthropomorphic isn't it it's almost like something coming to life it's a snoozing animal that's suddenly coming to life it's a very romantic thing and i i think i separate it into sort of ancillary uh activity so you, you you've got fuel pumps being primed you've got potentially uh starter motor and all the starter motor noises i mean there's some amazing starter motor noises out there we all know there are starter motors and there are starter motors um so i, I still i love listening to things like P a pagani zonda 7.3s that starter motor sound yeah it's the car's worth it for that alone it's just the sexiest sound and i love hearing early bosch k jetronic systems as they have that lovely sort of whizzy noise that under the under the bonnet <laughs> And I love hearing fuel pumps in the boot of racing cars. Yeah. But there's only one car for me. Well, that watching that BRM 16 cylinder yeah. piece of lunacy start up at Goodwood is it's that's more aerospace than car. That just looks like it might kill someone. So I sort of I stand and watch it, but I keep my distance just in case a lick of flame comes out. But I remember watching an amazing video ten years ago. Of, a, of an old 917 being started it was on it was on youtube it did the rounds and it's just this this band of people that have spent ages bringing this this beautiful flat 12 to life and it was amazing and it, it reminds you actually that it, it takes ages sometimes to coax these things to life there's smoke coming over they're all getting gassed and i thought to myself i'd never see that in life in, in my life but then edward and i i can't believe he's not mentioned this edward and i last summer was somewhere where bruce Kanepa had to bring a turbocharged flat 12 917 10 to life to go out on track and he spent 10 minutes getting it going 
from a sort of spluttering mess with shit flying out the back of it to just with his hand on the on the throttle linkage just blasting this thing so it was getting heat in it. It, it was extraordinary to watch it come to life. It was like Manish would understand what it's like to try and re resuscitate a human being. I've no idea what that's like. I don't want to be dismissive or disrespectful to doctors, but there was something doctor-like, the qualities of which he sort of was managing the air going in, the fuel going in, squirting stuff. It was it was a magical thing to watch. So for me, yeah, a, a, a Porsche flat 12 turbo coming to life with sort of tweaks and tickles. He might have just been doing it for theatre, but it certainly got me. Yeah. Mega. Very good. Uh, right, hold on. Here we go. My my phone is really dying here. I'm gonna gonna get in trouble in a minute. So, uh, whose job? It's a great question. This is posed by Mr. Cooper. Whose job in the motorsport or automotive industries would you most like to have? Uh, let's start with Neil Clifford because he is oh. the chief executive officer. What? What? Yeah, I've got my CEO buttons here. Yeah, yeah, that's all you need. Which can be, uh, you can answer any strategic issue with these buttons. You either do this. I said no. Or. Sure thing. That's it. Yeah. That's my job. That's um, it for training. Yeah, it's really good. So where would I take my buttons? I think the best job, which is not my answer, I think Andreas Preuninger has got the best job. Yeah. So if you just wanted the, the best job of, anyone in the automotive probably that's like a really cool job right you're just running the all the gt cars i know chris knows him very well he comes across i'll tell you what if he listens to this he'll be shaking his head going it's too no special why would, why would anyone want my job you no, only see no, the fun bit of it yeah we we can all say the bad bits of our job but you know what i bet he wouldn't give it up yeah i think that's I, I probably totally agree. that's probably the best job but if if i like challenges and i love the united kingdom and i don't really want to live anywhere else apart from the united kingdom even though you know you wish the taxes were lower and the nhs was better or whatever i think we you live in the best country in the world so therefore it would have to be one of the automotive brands the united kingdom and because i love a challenge it would probably be aston martin well they're looking for someone, Neil. So let's get him on there. Come on, boys I and don't, girls. I don't think I'm old enough. <laughs> no. You've got to be 70, haven't you? Yeah, you've got plenty of time. How old is Felice, though? Is he, how, does anyone know how old he is? Wow. Until until I retire. No, I think yeah. that's a mega job. That's a mega job. It would be a good job. Yeah, yeah it's a great yeah. job. So in all seriousness, it would be that job. Uh, right. Uh, Chris Cooper, if, if my phone's moving around, it's because I'm trying to do something very clever and move to my laptop in the car. This is <laughs> high, it's a high, it's a high stakes move. So, Chris Cooper, whose job in the automotive or motorsport industry would you most like to have? Well, I was thinking about this because sort of a, an acquaintance and an acquaintance who I'm trying to remember what his name was. Um, some job he's got, I can't remember quite who I was thinking of. I'm just holding a can of energy drink to the camera for those listening on audio. Um, <laughs> oh. I actually, the answer to this question is, and I'm holding up a copy of Autosport magazine to the camera for those listening, is the man driving that car? Mika Hakkinen, is that the... No, close. Coulthard? Close, not David Coulthard. His name is Rob Garifal. Okay. Or to a certain group of us, quite a few years ago, racing driver Rob. So when I started catering racing quite a long time ago, um, we were all racing, a bunch of mates got together, we're racing, racing these caterings. We were all pretty rubbish. And the person, the people running the team said, we need to get somebody in who knows what he's doing. So they brought in this bloke, Rob Garifall, and we all called him racing driver Rob, because he was a proper racing driver. And he showed how to drive his caterings. And he and I raced together a few years, and he taught me a lot about how to drive a catering. In fact, he was one of the wins I had in my 2001 Caterham series I won because he bump drafted me across the line at Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit we were three abreast going across the start finish line he was in fourth and he said I had to decide how I wanted to win I didn't like the other two so I bump drafted you he got second so um after that he got a job so he is now McLaren Heritage's chief test driver 
And I sent one of the links to you guys a while ago. He now tests all of McLaren's F1 cars, everything that they do. All of the stuff goes up the hill at Goodwood. He put on his Instagram last week, he was at Pembury shaking down a Senna F1 car. And he said in the launch, he said, that's 88 F1 cars I've tested now and counting. Wow. That's the bloke whose job in the motorsport industry I'd love to have. So, Rob, if you're listening to that, get a job. That's a good job. I don't know if Chris is there, Manish, but uh, he'll come back over I'm not, to you. I'm not, I'm not so sure that I imagined what bump drafting was, but it certainly wasn't involved in a racing circuit. Bump drafting, <laughs> bump drafting is when the bloke comes along behind you, literally as you're going along, hits the back of your car, you get shot forward, and he gets sucked he gets along behind you. I mean, it's probably he quite similar to what... you. He oh, touches yeah, you he physically arm. touches you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, top whack. Mm. So did it might actually be quite similar to what you were thinking of, Neil. Did you see bump drafting or bump drafting? <laughs> bump drafting. Oh, okay, well, we right. can oh. hear you now, Chris. What about That's this? Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, John, Danny might have to check this, but I've just managed to make my laptop work in the car. Then, no, yeah, well, good. Oh, it is working, and uh, we can, we, the, the volume's better. M Manish yeah, is about to tell us who he's going to be. Your dogs, your dogs are woken as well. Oh, there he is. Hello, Pip. Sorry, he's in the first to see me. Right. Okay. So, uh, Manish, whose job would you most like? Um, I would love if I had the skill, and I had the eye, and I had the hand. I would love to be Marcello Gandini. I would love. Ooh who have designed some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And that just honestly, he, um, you know, I've seen interviews with him and it's the versatility, but it is the art. And uh, it, it's not a, for him, it must be a very, very beautiful thing. I, I guess Pininfarina obviously had it, all the greats had it. The idea that somebody gives you a chassis and there's an engine, and you've got some concept of uh, the seating configuration. And if this thing has got an engine in the front, you know, you've got a drive shaft going through, so you've got a little lump and uh, where it goes. And, and you, you sit there and you look at it, and you must just look at this little thing from every single angle. And you understand contemporary design. I mean, like you really, really understand it. Mm. And I don't know if it's one person nowadays or even probably in the 80s, who absolutely goes from Alpha to Omega with these cars. But I think Gandini, kind of at his prime, he, he would have been, you know, like an early Giorgio Armani, just look at this model's shape. Just look at, you know, look at her feet, look at her proportions and just, just dress her. And I think to be able to do that and to integrate that also with the guys who did the great interiors, um, especially when they had a little bit of cash, maybe not too much, um, because that obviously produces, you know, all of these fantastic houses. It, it's, that, it, it's, it's that ability to just sit with a pencil and then create a model and then, you know, create these lasts on which people tap this metal. I would love to be able to do that. If you couldn't do that job, because that, that is a great job to do, and that would mm. be really, really wonderful. If you couldn't do that particular designer's job, could we all vote for you to do Jerry McGovern's job instead? <laughs> Don't bring Jerry into this. We were having a nice chat there as well, Chris. Sorry, Sorry. you know, but needs must. Yeah. But you know, I, I prefer your choice. We need less, Jerry. Manish. We need less, Jerry. Uh, and right. Can you imagine the food? You know, you do a job like that during the day. You go into your rather beautiful uh, Italian villa in the evening. You have your pasta and vegetables, a little glass of wine, start again the next day. I could do that job seven days a week. Yeah. No problem at all. No holidays. Yeah. Um, Chris Cooper, whose job would you like? He's done his. He's oh, done sorry. mine. Uh, sorry, Edward Lovett, whose job would you like, other than being CEO and founder? <laughs> <laughs> or, or his dad's job? I've warned you today, Chris, you need to... Be careful when you're taking the piss out of me and who you're doing it in front of. Anyone <laughs> yeah. that could write founder at the bottom of an email with a straight face has got my vote. You've got any job, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I've written a few down here, and I, I think obviously the obvious ones would be things like head of uh, the GT department at Porsche or the head of BMW M. 
yeah. um, because you're sort of not the CEO and you're in the re you're in the really fun part of the business. The cynical yeah. side of me want I want to be in he I want to be the head of Porsche allocation for the GT <laughs> department. <laughs> me first. Yeah, exactly. Um, Boris Johnson's <laughs> king of the world, you two. <laughs> and I, and I, I actually, I think Chris Cooper's got it right with, with his um, choice, because I, I, the, the, the obvious thing to say would be, well, just to be CEO of Ferrari, surely that's got to be the ultimate automotive job. Now, I know you're shaking your head, but we'd sort of think that, it's, especially yeah. in the Montezemolo era, you know, he was more powerful than God, you know, and, and, and look at, look how he's uh, perceived today. But yeah. I, I, I'm just not sure you'd want to be the CEO of any of these automotive companies. I think it's a, would be a brutal job. Um, and, and I think if you can quietly be the sort of the cool dude test driver of the best department, I, I think that would be a hard job to be if yeah. you were, if you were your job was just driving your favorite cars every day, um, that that would be. Edward, that would can be you the, can, oh. can you imagine what it would be to to say something like that to your dad just before you go off to boarding school? Daddy, I would like to be Sergio Marchioni. That's what I would <laughs> like to do. Yeah. Can you just imagine? That? Tell you what, lads, my multitasking is so good at the moment. My old phone, everyone loves my little old phone, is overheating because it can't do the tethering thing. So it just went down to 2%. I've just put my air con on and I'm holding it and cooling it against the vents. This is the <laughs> ultimate mobile studio. It's GTA amazing. It's the greatest <laughs> car ever. Right. So I reckon, I'm a lucky boy, I've witnessed more people in the automotive industry, in the motorsport industry, in top roles when I was, when I, when I have been a jobbing journalist. I've interviewed them, spent time with them. Mm. And I think there are so many cool jobs. It confirms why we love cars. And, and, and I, it, it, as a call to action, even though the industry is in the state of flux and change at the moment, if you love cars, you don't have to be a road tester in a car. There are so many great things to do in the car industry. And as long as it gets you close to your passion, it's the most fulfilling place to work. It doesn't matter. You might end up not with the job in the car industry that you wanted or thought you'd have, but it's still it's a wonderful place to work with some great people around you. The best ones I've seen. Um Sebastian Loeb and his pomp. Being Sebastian Loeb, the Sebastian Loeb rally driver, when he was three championships in, I watched him eat a three-course meal served by a Michelin rosetted chef somewhere in a Welsh forest. He then had a fag, got in the car, barrel rolled it with a journalist in it, walked to the end of the stage, got in a helicopter and left. And I thought that was that was quite That's a good job. Um, <laughs> I thought I thought that Luca. I, I don't want to confuse being the person with the job. I wanted to be Luca, but th that was separate to the Ferrari job. Uh, Luca could have been running a, an ice cream van and I'd still want to be him. So, yeah. so, so I always separate the man from the job. Andreas Reuniger's job is, is sensational, but I don't think any of us quite understand the skill set he has, the way that he ha he's effectively running a renegade bunch of children that want to make incredible cars with a with a board that wants to make you know, Panamera's and McCann's. It's, the skill set there must be incredibly difficult to navigate. I reckon the two I've seen that make me think that they are the best jobs, I'll, I'll say there's two of them. The, the second, and this should have been the first, but the second is when when Durheimer, Wolfgang Durheimer was the was the boss of Porsche R&D. In other words, you're the boss of Weissach, which is the heart of Porsche. He said he had the best job in the world to be in an interview, and I think he was right. And he described it like this. He said, this is the only place I think on the planet where we could where we could make a car starting with the first bolt. He said, I have everything at my disposal here to make a motor vehicle or like a GT3. And I don't need to need to leave this facility. I can I can I could I can basically machine the, the first bolt in my machining factory. I can make the entire engine, the <laughs> chassis, the suspension, and I have a test track here as well. And I have the best engine. Amazing. I have the best job. But his job is pipped by one person. And that was the test track, uh, Goodyear's test track at Miraval, uh, which was designed as a Formula One track. Uh, and Goodyear bought it and they just used it to test tyres. And Beltoise's brother used to work there, right? And he would wake up, you'd watch him, he'd wake up, he'd arrive, have a fag, drive around the wet handling circuit for a bit, beautifully sideways, a bit of dry handling. Then they'd all stop at midday for a three course sit down meal with wine. And then they'd do a few hours in the afternoon 
and that was their working day. That is the greatest job I've ever seen anyone have. Tire testing. All day, all he did was drive, but they always had a three-course meal with clean linen and red wine. I couldn't but... think of anything worse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I right. like driving, but not that fast. Not that fast. Right. <laughs> What's my notepad? Here we go. So the next one is arc. Oh, now this is to be. This is in the context of suspension and, and spring rates. Are modern cars too stiff? Edward Lovett. Um, mainly, yes. Especially sports cars, I would say they are too stiff. They're overtired. Is that a good? Is that a journalistic statement? Overtired. Um, uh, yeah, it could be. But the old, yeah, the the antidote is just to go to Richard Tuttle and get get him to build you the ultimate Porsche road car, and he'll damp it perfectly for you. Yeah, you're not wrong there. Uh, yeah. no, who's, got, who's got one of those? <laughs> Who'd like one of those? Who would like one of those? Yeah. Uh, uh, Neil Clifford. I suppose they are, really. I, I, I think they probably are. I do. When you get in an old car, the one thing you do think, actually, most of it's sh shittier than a new car, apart from the ride. But I like, yeah. the, I like the soft, squidgy ride. You get in a 70s Mercedes or, frankly, even a 80s Porsche whether it's because it's got the bigger tyres or it's just softer, it's just sort of nicer to drive on the road at sensible, cruisy little speeds, isn't it? The one thing I do think, you know, I, I do have the fortunate position to own a modern-ish Bentley, and it's quite lovely. But if you get in a new Porsche or new Ferrari or new mostly anything, it is a bit bloody bumpy and a bit harsh. And the journalists always seem to blame that. So you can help me on this, Chris, on the British roads. It's always about the British roads. And is that because these cars are mainly made in Germany and everything's beautifully soft? Not soft. Smooth. I, yeah. I think there's some truth in it. I, I remember Porsche, I remember Porsche many, you know, several years ago saying we are no longer interested in making cars that work on British roads because your British B roads Shit. are the, are the yeah. worst in the world. So why would we, for a while they did, they accommodated us, but then, you know, you'll know which era car it was. 901 GT3 comes along. It's like, well, clearly they don't care. It's no. just, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a fair comment. I think the British roads thing always comes up. You know, I, I've, I've got this new little, well, it's not new, it's new to me, Al, Al, Alpine. And it's bloody lovely on British roads. It's, yeah. you know, it's, there's no stiffness to it whatsoever. I think that's taught everyone a bloody lesson that you don't, you know, there are times to be stiff and maybe driving a car isn't one of them. <laughs> no comment. Uh, 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 Chris Cooper. Full of that. Uh, so this caused an unholy row in the Cooper household when we discussed it with Finley and Cameron and me. And I said, um, their first thing was, who the bloody hell suggested that? And I said, well, your esteemed father. I said, ah, are you demented? And I said, well, I think they are a bit, aren't they? And they were adamant they're not. And they said, if you, if you have your way, Dad, then you'll end up with cars that you'll hate to drive. And that's the conundrum, really. That is a conundrum. I mean, I've got an Alpine A110, and it is a lesson in wheel travel and compliance. And there's a gear, and again, Monkey, you know, in fact, you introduced me to him. Very sadly departed Graham Gleason, who was this wonderfully eccentric, mad New Zealander who was into bike racing. And he came to the UK quite a long time ago now. And he had just the most mercurial, magician-like view of suspensions and setup and all those kind of things and he had this fundamental view that cars were too stiff and you should have compliance in them and he developed the suspension for the yellow porsche that we raced at the nurburgring for years and years and years and his view was wheel travel compliance because that will give you grip or give you confidence and when other people drove our car at the ring they said what's wrong with your car 
It's far too soft. I said, what do you mean it's too soft? It doesn't feel like a racing car. Okay, drive it and then see how fast it goes. People said it was just a different kind of view as to how, I mean, the car that we gave him was a standard Porsche 997 Gen 1 Cup car. He took it to his workshop in Exeter and he looked at all of the spring rates and damper rates. And he said, your car has stiffer springs than the JCB diesel world land speed record car <laughs> I worked on yeah. in the salt flats. And last time I checked, the salt flats are quite flat and quite smooth. There are no corners. You don't need stiff suspension. Um, your car, so it's got, you know, your Porsche has got stiffer springs than that. And that thing weighs four tons. Um, so it's just all wrong. Was that a factory setup? That is yeah, that it's straight from yeah. the factory. And there were people in Germany, Mantai, Olaf Mantai. There were guys who drove for Mantai, who drove our car. Said Olaf would would not let you have this car in his garage. He would say it's far too soft. So I think the McLaren these days, a 720s, you'd say I'm not driven very much, but they've just got one. They've got a bit of a balance and of of ride softness, and they still handle. So I think. I'm torn on this one because I'm able to, I'm a bit like you. I do think modern 911s, GT3, 992, 992 Touring, it's quite stiff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it is. It's quite uh, stiff. To be honest with you, that's the only car I've got in my mind when I'm talking about the stiffness because there's it many is. there's many and, cars and it, out there. That's the point where on a track, yeah. it, you know, even at Castle Coombe, when we went there in September, it it's a bit bouncy. And yeah. driving up, because I go to Bissa quite a lot for Motorsport UK, and that, okay, that A41 is bad now because of HS2. So this it's a plea, really, and the A110 is a good example of it. And you're right, I mean, I love driving it in town, in London, because it's very small, and the potholes and the sleeping policemen, it glides over sleeping policemen, mm. like they're not there. So, mm. yeah, I think there's a... I think in many cases they are too stiff. I think we've lost... My response was very short-sighted because actually the the absolute contrast to something like a 992 GT3 Touring is is, is something like a 720S or a 750S, which is like an an S-class with a rocket launcher in the back of it. I'd love a Dakar 911. Yeah. Because I think that would give you 95%, 99% of the on-road enjoyment and it would just be like a limo over some of the... I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and just having a bit of choice. Spanish, how do you feel about stiffness? When I was a kid, um, Volvo is far too squidgy, far too squidgy. And um, all American cars, way, way, way too squidgy. Hated them, especially sitting in the back. I would always throw up, actually, in the back of a a big Volvo. Um, Somewhere the French worked out how to create hydro pneumatic suspension every citroen that i was ever in in the kind of 80s and early 90s i always thought was just wonderful completely wonderful they just they they did exactly what your alpines do which is why encouraging me to buy one i mean they do, they just do sound absolutely incredible and is it a is it a french thing to want to have a kind of absolutely superior ride because you've been talking about the germans haven't you um a little bit here and mm. um what, what I would say, though, is um, I was driven in a GTC4 Lusso from Maranello to Bologna Airport. And I got into this car, the front, and it was a Ferrari test driver who did the driving, so um, it wasn't me. And I sat in the passenger seat, and I really didn't enjoy the drive at all. Not even a bit. It was just... Stiff. Too stiff, you mean? Oh, I thought it was way too stiff. And I, I mean, you know, I'm middle-aged, but I'm not that middle-aged. And I'm, no. I'm just uh, a... How did he press the bumpy lap. road button, Neil? How did he press no. the bumpy road button? I don't think he'd pressed it. No. Well, <laughs> it's only for British roads, that button, isn't it? Yeah, well, really. You know, we went, we went past these sort of rather gorgeous vineyards and there were all the little small towns between sort of Maranello. And Bologna, and I really didn't particularly enjoy the ride. I mean, you know, the interior was gorgeous, but the ride, so I felt a bit too stiff. I don't know. Now I'm really falling in love with this Alpine 110. Just oh, do it tonight. Yeah, do it tonight. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Do it tonight. Uh, get, get stiff, stiff tonight. Well, I'm, I'm surprised people aren't being more equivocal because I think there's no doubt 
that cars are too they're too stiff i don't i just don't get it uh i i've got my i'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist on this and i could probably talk about it for an entire podcast so i'll i'll spare you that pain but the, the reality is if you if you if i flip what neil clifford quite rightly just said on its head motor cars have progressed in just about every area they are faster more efficient they accelerate harder they go faster they, they but they're less comfortable comfort is an absolutely integral part of most yes. people's driving in fact without realizing it most people place comfort probably second on their list of priorities the first would be how good the car looks then how comfortable it's far far above steering feel and such bollocks as you know and rot and handling and the, most people aren't nerds like us they don't care they want something comfortable yeah and most cars just aren't if you get an e39 on a 15 inch wheel m528 i and drive down a road that yeah. is so much more comfortable than any modern saloon car i think i think what happened was car makers decided to push push it a bit too far with the marketing departments to go up up on rim sizes yeah, 17, yeah rim size. 18, 19 then you got the low super super low profile tire what's the one component on a car that a car maker can afford to spend nothing on because no one can see it and it's not sexy springs and dampers so you'll end up, you know, if you knew, I, I, I took a Camaro Z28 from 2015 to a well-known sports car maker. And I and I, that car, that was a very stiff car, but it had some very expensive components on it. It had a carbon ceramic front disc and it had Multimatics, very trick dampers off a of Ford GT on it. And, uh, and this car maker said, Ford could do that because they've got a deal with Multimatic, but we have never spent that much money on a damper unit in our, and we never would because there's no benefit to us at all. We, we get the car we want. All of you think it's great, and and this, uh, but ultimately, all the suspension you buy aftermarket is so much better than the shit we put on it OEM. Wow. So, yeah, it's it, they are mostly quite cheap components. That the very upper end, they're starting to spend money on dampers now, but really, the fixed rate stuff they had for years was. So jumped. one of the things that Graham Gleason, so his business, he very sadly died very suddenly of a heart attack. Uh, I'm going to actually, Edward, I mentioned this to you earlier, before we end tonight, I'm going to just tell a story about a car that's on the auction site at the moment uh, for a dear friend of ours who similarly died very suddenly. Um, but one of the things that Graham's dampers have, XTC, they have, you, you met, there's a, there's a cylinder and there's a piston the damper goes into. And the stiction, stiction's a great word, it's kind of onomatopoeia, you kind of know what, it's, what it means. So you had these roller bearings, so there was almost zero stiction. So if there's a change in load, the damper components moved rather than stuck for a bit and then sort of jerked a bit. And he clearly spent squillions on them. We were so blessed to have him drive our, develop our car. And I just, you say, there, there are exceptions to this, because I think you, you bang on, monkey. Mark, I know it's getting a bit old now mark seven and a half golf we've got a mark seven and a half golf 1.4 tsi in the family that rides that yeah. is such a comfy car to good drive car. if car. i had to have one car that was pretty modest to do city driving motorways okay fun i'd have a golf 1.4 tsi but why do people put up with such poor ride comfort most cars are just uncomfortable you, know, you get you get in it and they crash around, they smash into potholes. Like Manish describes, you get in a yeah. Lusso for God's sake. You know the, the clue should be in the in the in the title, and actually it rattles your teeth out. And I've I've bored people with it. I'll tell you a quick story about Graham Gleason with his wonderful suspension. We once went to Atlanta to for some so, to do a track event, and he had a load of cars there that were running a suspension, and he bought spare damper tubes out and stuff to take to these clients. And we got to Atlanta Airport and we went to collect them. And these police came out with these, with whatever the police, whatever they were, customs people, and they went, "Yeah, we've taken that. You're not having it back." And we went, and Graham, with this New Zealand accent, went, "Why, mate?" And they went, "Because it looks like an RPG." And that was it. They said, "It, it looks like armaments, and there's no way you're going to persuade us those tubes are for dampers. So go away." And we never got them back. We turned <laughs> up with no suspension. Um, Love so. That. Here we come to where they hand you a bazooka with a packet of cornflakes. On, on reflection, they didn't look good. It, did, it wasn't a good, you know, they, they did look a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. So, uh, what is uh, <laughs> your favorite Daihatsu? I think it's important that sometimes we remind ourselves that this is not a serious podcast. So, I don't reckon 
managed even knew what a Daihitsu was before I asked him before or the fact that it's now wholly owned by Toyota. I only realized that from 98 when I when I wicked beat it the other day. I love yeah. that. So Manish, what's your favorite Daihatsu? How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Although, with Mel, how dare you? How Fuck dare you. <laughs> um, it is actually one I can answer, not through ownership, but through extensive use. Yep. It is the Daihatsu Terios. It yeah. is our Tokyo car. That is wonderful. Yeah. That is the car. So yep. it, basically, this car found its way to Tobago at some point at the turn of the millennium. They're all reconditioned, all the ones out there. They're all sort of ex-Japanese cars. They come out. And the thing about this car is, I'm not sure you would operate with it, okay? But what's brilliant about it, it's a genuine 4x4. Just... It's so narrow, this yeah. car. This yeah. definitely is wife, driver, daddy, and um, car seat. And even Dashi, at the age of 14 months, was struggling in the back for the <laughs> leg room. I mean, it's a small car, but they are fantastic. They just, they touch wood, they don't break down. They got any hill. They do have a bit of body roll occasionally you do feel a bit nervous but i've never flipped one if you just go off road a little bit you have a little muddy track down to a beach or something absolutely fantastic adequate air conditioning adequate power one tank of petrol for a two-week holiday <laughs> you can get the sand off the seats because the seats are actually really well made cloth i mean you just you can get the sand off the seat and get them back absolutely soaked as you put your towels and other sort of crap in and the thing starts up every time and it is just it's a beautiful car it is out i of did not car. realize i'd be inciting a love letter to the daihatsu terrier <laughs> yeah I love that's, that what the, that's what the addicts are all about uh neil clifford what's your favorite daihatsu i have no fucking idea <laughs> it would love it what's your favorite daihatsu can i, can well, I just say one thing oh, i thought oh, oh. My God, I've no idea about Daihatsu. I've never looked at them. I'd better first time in the history of this bloody podcast. I've had to use Google to get to an answer. Every other answer for fifty-three weeks has been in my head, apart from this stupid bloody question. So I go on to Google. Right, the Daihatsu website. Daihatsu sales have now ceased across Europe. Yeah. Sales of Daihatsu motors have now ceased. However, we wish to reassure the Daihatsu owners that all after-sales services were... There's none for sale. You can't you know why? buy one of these bloody things. You know why? No. There's a I safety scandal. Either. There's a safety scandal. Is there? Toyota, or somebody's been cheating on safety tests. It came out end of last year. No, oh, I do. I, I read that. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. For the sake of collecting cars lawyers, can I say allegedly... Allegedly, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. The, when, um, but the CEO came out and admit, admitted it, didn't he? Basically. They Did all he? admitted it. Yeah, they said, oh, you know, I'm very sorry. We lied, basically. For that, yeah. the whole of the time, it was all bullshit. There's My no airbags. airbags. And stuff. There's no, nothing. I just wanted a one word answer so we could get it out of the way. We've had a love letter. Now we're talking about espionage. Come on, work there's, with me. There, there's no way it could have been a scandal early on in the Daihatsu life of no. the test. And the Taft, which is a tough or mighty four-wheel transport, that, <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is what it stands for. Which that is, is brilliant. Which, exactly, that is the Daihatsu uh, Taft. That's, that, that's what it stands for. And whilst I did delve into Google to do some research, when we talk about um, having a little house down by the sea or something like that, which is probably going to get rotten with um uh sand and salt and water and all those sorts of things or or up in the mountains and in, in up in the mountains in france they love things like fiat panda four by fours but the old ones a little hack i can imagine being a ski instructor and having a daihatsu rocky uh, and throwing my skis on the roof and dropping it in six meters of snow at the bottom of the ski lift before i go and do my lessons during the day so good for you daihatsu don't yeah. worry about the scandal we're on your side we are <laughs> chris cooper so i'm totally with manish i think the terios is just the loveliest little it's a japanese panda four by four yeah it's just the it looks perfectly formed it's like a real car slightly smaller 
Would you have that or a Subaru Justy? I'd have a Terios. Oh, okay, interesting. I have a, I have a, I tell you what, if I had to have a two car, if I had to have a functional worker day ski resort, you know, doing, doing practical things, I'd have a two car Daihatsu garage. I'd okay. have the high jet, they all did those little Kai car type pickups, Honda Acti and you know, the yeah. Daihatsu high jet, the high, Daihatsu high jet, little two seat cab. Tiny yeah. little itsy, itsy bitsy little payload and a Terios. Terios is just it's so small. But it's a proper car. It's got four wheel drive. Got a bit of ground. Got it has got some ground clearance. There is there's a there's a bit of a theme here. Do you think everyone that worked at Daihatsu was like my size was two thirds size? Because you've got the Copen, <laughs> you've got the the Cappuccino. Were well, they just ickle people? Then they no, made I can it. get into Japan, a Terios. I've driven a Terios. Japan, they're all little. No, I can drive a Terios. Uh, Neil Clifford. Uh, so. <laughs> So well, I, you, just, no one's, I, I love Japan, all, right? I love all these these brilliant cars you're mentioning. But for me, Daihatsu is about two cars. The, first of all, the four track. The, the Daihatsu. Well, that's the obvious one. It's 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 it deserves to be a hero car. My yeah, my, yeah. my sister in law had one new, and it lasted for something like twenty six years. It, it's just unbreakable. Made a made a made a Land Rover Defender look like the piece of crap it is. So you know, I think uh, fair play to that. But there was one car I can remember one of those beautiful moments when someone is driving you in their new car and they want to demonstrate the performance prowess of their vehicle. This would be the early 90s, probably. And I was with someone who had a Peugeot 205 GTI 1.6. It was brand new. And we were at the traffic lights. And he and he said to me, I was a little boy then, said, watch this. It's going to smoke this thing to the right of me. It's so fast. And the car to the right of us was white and it just went off into the distance like a scolded cat. And it was a charade GTTI, the little one liter yeah. motherfucker they had. And, <laughs> and like, this bloke was so, he was like, Yeah, we're going to dust this little rice rocket to my right. And it just drove away from it in a straight yeah. line. That's a good it one. was so fast. Yeah. And I, I, they always looked like they'd been kicked up the bottom. They were a bit hyena ish. They were, their ass was low, like a dog that had done something wrong. Yeah. And I, I, I <laughs> I just think they're wonderful. They're just a brilliant, quirky piece of Japanese engineering. And they had a one-make rally series for them as well. Yes. Which my my co-driver, the wonderful Brimmore Pierce, said he he bought one of these things. He's, he referred to it as being virtually undrivable on a stage. And they had <laughs> like 30 of them in the Welsh forest with these brilliantly <laughs> talented Welsh people trying not to die in, in hitting a tree. So I just, Daihatsu is one of those companies that has a wonderful story. And I, I think some of the vehicles represent that as well. So there we go. We've covered what's your favourite Daihatsu. So now, this is a very, very strange one. All I got from Chris Cooper was, can we play my service station cheese game? This is not about personal hygiene. This is something else. Over to Chris Cooper. I thought we are doing it next week. Oh, shit. We're doing it next week. Sorry. We'll do it next week. <laughs> right, okay. No cheating. So, save so your now, cheese. Save your move, cheese. Let's move straight to the two-car garage. Hold on. Uh, I've got to read it. Here we go. Uh, where was it? Uh, you want me to do it? I got it here. Uh, yeah, you might need to do it. Go on. Away you go. I can't find it on here. Oh okay, no, I've got I don't it. Know. Here we go. Um, so everybody, it was on your Kim's website. Yeah. Um, the you're two a plumber. Car, you're a plumber. Oh, and sorry. Everyone okay. knows plumbers don't drive Porsches. However, you run a very successful business and have decided to update the garage with a couple of interesting cars. You have a girlfriend, however, she drives a Golf, and you don't need to cater for her, but you do need something practical for the Monday to Friday job, plus a weekend car to put some spice back into your life. You're a fan of American, Australian muscle cars and Japanese workhorses. Your budget is £130,000. Plumbers earn a lot of money. Uh, I would like to hear what Edward Lovett has to say. So, did, sorry, you did cover he has a penchant for Australian American muscle in there, yes. didn't you? You did, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Um, sorry, let me just get my uh, my notes up here. So I, they, I, I'm, I, the, I think as the plumber, he, he's obviously going to want to lob some stuff in the back. And so I'm going to appease his desires for Australian muscle. So he's going to have a, a Malou HSV. Um, so, so, so he can lob stuff in the back for his working day. Sorry if that's annoys you, Christopher. And then the American muscle, because 
I'm not saying all plumbers are dodgy, but you know, there's got to be quite a few dumb, d- d- dodgy plumbers out there. Uh, apologies for all of you non-dodgy plumbers, and congratulations to you dodgy plumbers that are out there enjoying your cars. But I, I, I wanted to give him something that he might find useful one day, um, which is a Dodge Charger Challenger Jailbreak. He was on there. A jailbreak sign on that dashboard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With 807 brake horsepower. <laughs> uh, okay, Manish Pandy, what are your two cars? Um, do you remember I spent the summer selling Mitsubishis while I was still a medical student? And um, the one that I always really liked the most, it wasn't the Starion, but it was the Galant. And I think they yeah. did turn that into a rally car, didn't they? At some point, the, yeah. the VR four was a homologation car. So I, so I, I, I did really like the look of it. I actually quite like the gearbox. And um, I figured last week, you know, the poor guy was hauling around hors d'oeuvres while trying to stay kind of incognito. This week, he's going to need an estate of some description that has all the sort of J joints and U joints and everything else. And I, I did see one of these. I thought it was just called the Galant Estate, but it is actually called the Legnum. And I, I like yes, that. Yes, that is nice. Yeah. Uh, Mitsubishi Legnum. Now, it turns out you can only import them. So uh, you have to import these things. And um, they're not that expensive. They go from about five or six. I'm going to do that again. It's in focus now. Oh, now you miss what it yeah. looks like. I, that is the Galant. Yeah. yeah. It's a Galant, with, it's Galant Estate, basically. It's okay. really. Yeah. I think it's great. They, they had a version of this. It's the VR4 Estate, 2.5 litres. I think it's 200 and something horsepower, four-wheel drive. It's got a Momo steering wheel and proper Recaro seats. I think, I think I've got one of those as a plumber. And you've got the big boot at the back. Yeah. So you can get the loo in. And then, <clears throat> do, you, did, do you remember watching Mad Max and falling in love with the whole idea of the outback and going at 200 miles an hour through that i mean that film was basically a western about oil it was such a great movie and um, because i'd never really sort of associated australia with muscle cars i mean i just hadn't and um i remember the first aussie muscle car that a friend of mine sent a photo of when he moved to uh, melbourne and it was the ford falcon gt and it was just, I never, you know, just, there's something about it that's sort of European American. What I was shocked to find out is that this plumber couldn't afford one. They go from about 150,000 pounds to a million. I mean that, so he had to look down a bit and I'll tell you what I found. It was the GM Holden Turana LX. Ooh. And this, I think this is a great looking, look at, it's doing it again. Look at look at look at that! Look at that! Yeah, it's, it's not it. <laughs> uh, but that is... <laughs> it's <just> really <laughs> That's what I would get. I would get. I would get this golden Torana LX, and I would pretend to be Mad Max every weekend, burning up everything in Shrewsbury or wherever I was a plumber. Uh, Neil Clifford. Right, well, this plumber's a mate of mine. And um, we've got we've gone for curry, and he's like, I've got this hundred and thirty grand. I, you know, I like Japanese things, I like Aussie things, and I'd say, don't be such an idiot. You don't want any of those bloody things. You can never love the Japanese car, and what the hell is an Australian car? It doesn't really exist. So, American would, or Australian? I would. Uh, well, Are we trying to, we're trying to be offend entire nations on this. No, problem. no, no. I'm giving him advice. <laughs> continents, continents. I'm giving him advice on how best to spend his one hundred and thirty thousand pounds on a two car garage that he will never get bored with these two cars, and you will love them forever and get immense pleasure out of them. So that's how I approach this and ignored the Japanese Aussie thing. So I would buy for my daily a BMW One M. Because it's just, it, that car gets better looking by the hour, doesn't it? We, yeah. Some of us have maybe owned one. We wish we still owned one. I've got a very cool friend called Luke who's had one forever and would never sell it in the orange. It's just a handsome bloody car before BMW went all a little bit shit. 
So I would definitely have that. That's about 40 grand, right? Yeah. They've never been, you know, they've never been anything different apart from 40 to 45 grand, have they? So you never lose any money on the bloody thing. And then, so I've got, a, I've got, what have I got? 90 grand left. That's quite tough. What would you go and buy to have immense fun for 90 grand? You can look at Ferrari, you can look at Lamborghini, you can, you know, you can't look at Porsche because of the plumber thing. You know, I'm going to buy a McLaren before McLaren went ugly. So I'd buy a 650S Spider. I yeah. think, you know, you can't afford a 675, but you know what? It's almost a 675. Everyone's watched the Chris Harris video a million times about how the 650 is just quite a lot better, even though it might be not the original iPhone of the of the of the 12 C, it's a better car. It's fast as hell. You can take the roof off, but it's a metal roof. You get a good one that's been looked after. It's not really going to break. And for 130 grand, you've got 10 years of extreme pleasure because you've ignored the brief. And I luckily, like he's a plumber, so he can fix all those hoses that keep firing. Yeah, exactly. It's plumbing rods for the weekly job. Those two cars are brilliant. Okay. Chris Cooper, where are you going to well, put it? Well, I have actually answered the brief, but I have actually answered the brief, but I'm just going to make a quick okay. parish notice before, if I can. I mentioned this earlier. I said Edward. So um, there's a car on the auction website now. It's a 2007 997 Turbo. It's a single owner car. And the single owner of that car was a very, very close friend of ours who very sadly died very suddenly at the end of last year from an aortic dissection, apparently, he literally dropped down dead. Um, so we've uh, helping his widow, who's a good friend of ours. So the car's got on the website. She needs to sell it, um, and to support her and her and the charity behind it, I would like everyone to bid on that car, please. It's a wonderful car, one owner, nine nine seven, um, grey with that lovely terracotta inside. Um, I will match the buyer's premium as a donation to a charity of her choice, which is the Aortic Dissection charitable trust so it's a lovely car it's in our shed here right now anyone's come to look at it contact collecting cars website come and have a look at it here um and i the buyer's yeah, premium manual 997 turbo the man, one owner manual 997 turbo that's rocking um, horse shit people that they're rare things there's and we and, and we collecting cars will donate the buyer's premium to the same charity well that's super kind of but that's very very kind of you and uh, mel will be very very kind so um it ends, ends on Monday, I believe. It's on Monday, Monday yeah. Edward, thank yeah. you. Very, uh, super kind, Edward. Thank you. Um, I listened to the brief of my plumber friend. Um, and I think there are two... I think he'd have, as his workhorse, an FJ62 Land Cruiser, but slightly titified by these outfit TLC, who do these slightly restored resto-modded uh, yeah. FJ62s. Really yeah. nice thing. Get a nice one of those, about 75k. Um, he's a plumber, he's a fan of muscle cars, he's going to have to have a C3 Corvette, a Neil Armstrong Special, 1969. Um, I found one, 1969, about 75k, so that comes to 150k, but he's a plumber, he'll knock him down, and that's what he'd have. He'd have a lovely FJ62 and a Neil Armstrong Special C3 Corvette. Nice. Uh, Edward, have you been, Edward? I've been, I've no yes. Clip speed, managed speed, Chris Cooper's been, so it's just me. Right, okay. Uh, so I'm going to allow this as an opportunity to recommend a car that I see around now and again. I think they're cool as hell. They don't fit with anything the addicts should be proposing or talking about, but I think he should have a VW ID Buzz because I love them. It's the coolest electric car on the road. Yeah. They look bollocks. Go and get an ID Buzz. We should all have one. I, I just They are cool. It's the only acceptable electric vehicle for me. I know they've got no range and everyone hates them, but I keep seeing them and they make me smile. I so, likewise. Yeah. So I think ID Buzz for me. Uh, and the, so I love an Aussie muscle car. And Edward and I have just come back and I got to drive an HSV GTS RW1. Ah, ah, a bit of kit that was. Cool. The Starling cool. bloody muscle saloon. But it's too expensive. I haven't got the budget. I'd love one. And I was going to go for an HSV GTS R. But then I thought, it's not the best muscle saloony thing I've ever driven, which was by miles 
the uh, Camaro ZR1 that I had. Uh, sorry, the, the Z28 that I had for two, three years myself. That that car, 2014. If you get one of those, what a machine that is! Yeah, so Z28 and an ID Buzz. We right. we sold that W1 uh, this morning in oh last night in uh, in Australia, and it's coming to Blighty. Is it? What did it yeah. go for? Two hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars or something like that. Wow. What the? I mean, wow. Yeah. Well done, the Australian collecting cars team. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. It's so, uh, right. Uh, let's move on to some music. Uh, I'll ask Edward Lovett. He'll say, "I don't want to do music." So, Edward, any music or not? Yes, I do. Actually, I was, I was, I was trying to decide something. Uh, I want, I wanted to go old this time, or older than I normally go. So, I've gone Don McLean, American Pie. Oh. There you go. It's round the campfire, coming of age, all that. I can imagine you and Neil Clifford round the campfire, exchanging stories, Neil singing falsetto. Right, what are we going to go for? Neil Clifford. Oh, you know what? I was I was in a band once, and I was thinking about this, um, and I, I was a keyboard player, but then the band disbanded, and three days later, it restarted without a keyboard player. So I, think, <laughs> I don't so like I, that band. I, I think it was it was it was more my skills or lack of as a keyboard player. But anyway, we used to cover a lot of stranglers. Oh. And you know, you, you can you can name a million bloody songs from the Stranglers, but no more heroes, the Stranglers, great song. It's one of the best ends of any song ever. Yeah. Is that yeah. the Rosses looking for you? No, uh, there's just a bloke. As there's a bloke in an M one forty I. You see in the review M one forty I's are becoming quite rogue, aren't they? Uh it's right. So right. uh uh Manish Pandey, what are you gonna go for? I'm gonna go for Lovey Sifri, my song. A song so beautiful, so cool, and so wonderful that even the great Kanye West had to sample that to create another piece of music. It is, wow. it is the most beautiful song. But before he it? had his titanium teeth inserted. Well, exactly. Yeah, yes, really. exactly. Before he became two throat from Breaking Bad. His titanium mono tooth. Inspired <laughs> by Jaws from the James Bond movies. The shark has rather truly jumped on that one. Chris Cooper. So I always like to think about something I'd like to listen to. And I was thinking about when this first came out. Uh, it's Creep by Radiohead. Oh, that's good. Great. There's a, there's a bit early in the song. I, I'm not a musical colossus. There's a bit early in that song where it meanders along. And then the guitars give a couple of big thwacks, whatever they're called, on the strings of his guitar, which I like to think is me in a car changing down two gears, big whap on the throttle for each of those thwacks. And then you're off and you're sort of like flowing through the bends. Great song to drive to, Creep by Radiohead. Yeah. So I'm going to go 80s and a bit of quirky Frenchness because they now and again they come out with a tune that just cro cross language barriers. Voyage, Voyage by Desireless. Oh, is great a song. It's a great driving song. Put it on. It's got rhythm, and it just it just suits driving. It's one of those, and you know, and her voice is is stunning. So, uh, thank you very much. For okay, I'm just going to end on one recommendation. Uh, as we've just come back, and we've got still got Australian petrol running through our veins. Go yeah. onto YouTube and watch last weekend's Bathurst 12 oh. Hour recap oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on YouTube. And what yeah. a fucking race that was. I was going to suggest. I, I was going to suggest the same thing. And there's a an uncorked Merc GT3, yeah. unrestricted Merc. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Oh, how on it? We yeah, yeah. up against the walls. And for me, one piece of housekeeping. We we I, I shared this with my fellow Alex. A guy called Neil sent a little note to us. I won't read it out. It's personal about. Uh, listening to some of our playlists as he'd collected his cage, his new cage from Track Day Toy, and uh, it, it, it's your your note uh, touched and over with all of us. It was a, it was a heartfelt. We thank you for listening, like we do to all of you. So we'll see you. Or you'll hear from us next week for episode fifty four. Thank you for bearing with us. Myself, uh, Chris Harris, uh, Neil Clifford, Chris Cooper, Manish Pandey, and Edward Lovett. Thank you very much for listening. 